Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as you know, last time in class, we took the uh, unit test over the unit where we looked at writing the names and formulas for both salts and molecules. Um, you'll find out when we go over this test that those skills are very much essential. The reason is because we are going to, for the rest of the year, take these salts and molecules and we are going to do chemistry with them, both conceptually here in class, but also over in lab, we're going to break out these salts and molecules and we're going to start reacting them together and look at how they react together, look at the products they form, look at amounts of reactant and amounts of product. Um, very much that's going to be the foundation for how we move forward with the rest of the year. So with this in mind, um, we need to understand that, that what we're doing now, what we're doing in this unit, connects very closely. It builds on what we did in the previous unit, only now these salts and molecules that we talked about largely theoretically are going to become the um, participants in chemical reactions that we're going to be doing for the rest of the year. So, in order to do this, guys, today what we're going to do is two things. This class for the rest of the year is about to become mathematical again. If you remember very early in the year, we talked about, we talked about rounding, we talked about significant digits, we talked about the rules for multiplying and adding and all these other things, and we were doing a lot of math. And then, guys, the class became much more conceptual. Nuclear chem, electrons, um, intermolecular forces, molecular structures. Um, guys, this class became largely conceptual. Well, to end the year, um, things are going to become much more concrete, if you will, and mathematical. So in order for us to be successful with that, we need to go back and talk about significant digits. Um, just really briefly, we'll do this as review with the understanding that we'll be getting uh, back into this as the unit progresses. Then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce you to a concept called formula mass. Um, you'll see in a moment, essentially what we're doing is we're taking the chemical formulas for salts and molecules and using the data on our periodic tables, we are going to figure out um, how much these salts or molecules weigh. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, reminding ourselves about significant digits. My board is drawing dots. Just a moment. Reminding ourselves about significant digits. Um, guys, I know this all flew up in one very quick slide. Um, I would encourage you to not write these things down. These are all things that you learned previously. Um, it's somewhere around August 24th um, is when we talked about this at the beginning of the school year. If you need more support, jump on our website, um, scroll back, hitting previous month till you get back till August. Somewhere around the 24th, you'll see something that says um, accuracy or significant digits. And that's where you'll find uh, more information if you need more of a refresher. Um, but guys, fundamentally, we learned some time ago that significant digits are numbers that communicate, that communicate accuracy. They tell us not how big or small a number is. They actually tell us how accurately we measured that big or small thing. And guys, what we found out is there are actually three types of significant digits. Non-zeros, final zeros after the decimal, and trap zeros. And then guys, we had this strange rule number four that basically says nothing else is significant, which really isn't a rule. It just tells us that we're done identifying significant digits. So guys, for example, rule number one. It says non-zeros are significant. So if it's a 1 through a 9, it's significant. So for example, if we have 125 um, meters, that number is accurate to three significant digits. 
the one, the two, and the five are all significant digits. Now, what if we have a number like this? What if we have a number like point one, two, five, and again, meters? Well, that would also be three significant digits. The one, the two, and the five are all, are all not zeros. They're significant. But now what happens if we come along and we put a zero on this? Guys, this zero tells us important information. It tells us that we looked to the tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths. We looked to the ten thousandths place and we just did not find anything there. So this zero is telling us we tried to measure more accurately it's just that that more accurate measurement made us more sure of the previous measurement because it wasn't longer or shorter, even down to the ten thousandths. So this number, 0 0.1250, would be four significant digits. That is an example of rule number two. Final zeros after the decimal point are significant. So in order to understand this better, let's talk about examples that don't count as this. So for example, if we go back to the number 1, 2, 5, and if we add a 0 here, that is still only three significant digits. That zero is not a significant digit. Now, don't be confused. Is it important? Absolutely. If we get rid of that zero, then it changes the number to 125. So, guys, that number, that zero's got to be there. But all that this zero tells us is that the number is big. It's not 125, it's 1,250. So it tells us the number is big, but it does not tell us how accurately we measured that big thing. So that zero is not significant. So what about something like this? What if we have the number 0 0.0125? How many significant digits are there? And guys, again, the answer is three. Is this zero important? Absolutely. If we get rid of it, it changes the value of the number. But this zero does not tell us how accurately we measured the thing. It just tells us that that thing is small. So again, final zeros, let me make these stand out, final zeros after the decimal are significant. This zero is not significant because it is final, but it's not after the decimal. This zero is not significant because while it is after the decimal, it's not final. So it has to be both. And then guys, finally, rule number three. Rule number three tells us that trap zeros are significant. So if we have the number 1,205, that zero is trapped between the two and the five, and therefore it's significant. So guys, we'll be going over this more as we move on. If you have a general sense of this, you'll be okay as we move forward. But guys, if in your heart of hearts, you know that this is completely foreign to you, take a couple minutes, go back and rewatch the screencast from August refresh your memory. All right, so then following that, not only do we need to remember um, significant digits, we need to remember how we handle these mathematically. And the rule is this. When, when, well, and specifically what we need the rule for is figuring out how to report our answers from mathematical calculations. So if we are doing multiplication or division, we will round our answer to the same number of significant digits as the few fewest significant digits in our setup. Then if we are adding or subtracting, we don't care about significant digits. We care about decimal places. And here, we will round to the fewest decimal places. Again, these are things that we learned before. We'll come back to them. But I just wanted to quickly refresh your memory. Okay, so with that said, we are now ready to move into the new skill. Oh, drawing dots again. We now need to move into the new skill that you are going to need to get on top of today. So here's where we are. In the last unit, we learned 
learned to write chemical formulas for salts and for molecules. Today what we're going to do is we are going to figure out the masses of these salts and molecules. But in order to do that, the first thing that we need to do is we need to learn to break compounds down into their elements. So for example, if we have the salt, remember we know it's a salt because magnesium element number um, 12 is a, is, a, is a metal. If we have the salt magnesium phosphate, we need to know what elements this is made of. So we know that, and I'll switch to red, um, we know that there are magnesium atoms in magnesium phosphate. Now here's where we've got to be careful because we know that there's phosphate in magnesium phosphate, but phosphate is not an element. It's a polyatomic ion and it is composed of phosphorus and oxygen. So bringing those ideas together, magnesium phosphate is actually composed of Again, my board is being grumpy. It is composed of magnesium atoms, phosphorus atoms, and oxygen atoms. Now, guys, the question is how many? So how many oxygen atoms do we have? Well, we know from that three that we have three uh, uh, magnesium atoms. Now, how many phosphorus atoms? And this is where we need to realize that this two distributes through the parentheses. And so from looking at this, each PO4 has one phosphorus, but there's two of them, so that means we have two phosphoruses. Then each PO4 has four oxygens, but there are two of those, so that means that we have eight oxygens. So we have two phosphorus atoms and we have eight oxygen atoms. So with that as a foundation, let's look at another example and let's look at how we might understand this a little, a little differently. So here we have the salt, iron three sulfate. And guys, if you're looking at this and going, wait, there's two irons, how is that iron three sulfate? Guys, remember that the three is the charge and not how many atoms there are. And I don't expect you to be as proficient at this as as I am, but at the bottom you need to understand that that two does not tell you that this is iron two phosphate. This two tells you how many, but this is actually iron three, I'm sorry, I said phosphate, this is iron three sulfate. So with that said, what we need to be able to do is break this into, this will let me do it, nope. Just a moment. What we need to be able to do is we need to be able to break this into its component atoms. So this um, salt is composed of iron, Fe, S sulfur, and O oxygen. Again, guys, the idea is that sulfate, SO4, is a polyatomic ion. There are three sulfates, but that three distributes through the parentheses and as a result, we have two iron atoms, but then distributing the three through the parentheses, we have three sulfur atoms and a dozen oxygen atoms. Okay. So we've established this idea of breaking these things down into their component atoms. Now what we need to do is based on this, we've got to figure out how much these things weigh. And so in order to do that, we need to take this one more step and we need to talk about what are called formula masses. So formula masses are simply the mass of a salt or a molecule. If it is a salt, we call it a formula mass. If it's a molecule, we call it a molecular mass. At the end of the day, they're the same things. Just understand that technically, we can't call salts molecules, so we just generically call them all formula mass. Guys, in order to figure this out, what we're really talking about is the mass of what we call one formula unit of a compound. Guys, don't get caught up in the words. The idea is simply, if we have the chemical formula for a compound, just like we did on the last test, what does it weigh? So guys, 
these numbers will always be given in what are called, you may remember this from when we figured out the masses of atoms and we talked about isotopes and filled in those tables. These numbers, small red numbers on the periodic table, are given in the units atomic mass units. So with that said, let's figure out the formula mass for sodium phosphate. So in order to do this, we first of all need to know what sodium phosphate is made of. Just like we said before, this is composed of three sodium atoms, one phosphorus atom, and four oxygen atoms. And guys, please notice here, this four does not distribute. It is not in parentheses in a four over here. There's only one phosphate, so that does not distribute. So with that said, in order to now figure out the mass of this, what we need to do is we need to go to the periodic table and we need to find the masses of these elements. So guys, looking up element 11 on the periodic table, that's sodium. Sodium has a mass of 23.0 atomic mass units. Make sure that you see that number. And what we're going to do for right now is we are going to round to one to one decimal place, so 23.0. Then when we look up phosphorus, we find that the mass of phosphorus is 30.97 and so on, but to one decimal place, we round that to 31.0. Then we need the mass of oxygen, and some of you may actually know this, um, to one decimal place it rounds to 16.0. Now what we need to do is we need to find out the mass of the entire salt. We have the mass of the atoms, 23, 31, and 16, but now we need to find the mass of the entire salt. To do that, we multiply. We have three sodiums, each weigh 23, that gives us 69. We have one phosphorus, that's 31, and then we have four oxygens, each weighs 16, that would be a total of 64, and when we add those all up, the formula mass for sodium phosphate is 164 atomic mass units. Now guys, notice that we abbreviate atomic mass units with a U, and you're more than welcome to do that as well. Okay, we have one more example to go, and uh, then we're going to have uh, time for you to work on your homework. So, let's do one final example, and this is more representative of what your homework is going to look like. So, guys, straight out of what we learned on the test, what we're going to do here, what, sorry, what we represented on the test, if we're going to do this, we need to know the chemical formula for chromium-3 sulfate. So how do we approach that? Well, what we do is this. We know that chromium is Cr, find it on the periodic table. It is element 24, and guys, then we need its charge. And chromium has a lot of different charges that it could take on. The Roman numeral tells us that it's three. Then we need to find sulfate. Sulfate ends in eight, which means it's on our yellow polyatomic sheet. This would be SO4, and its charge is minus two. Now bringing this together in the formula for a salt, three and two meet up at six. So how many threes make six? Well, that would be two. So it's CR2. Then how many SO4s do we need in order to make minus six? And that would be three. So this would be SO4, three. So this would then be um, chromium-3 sulfate. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out the mass of chromium-3 sulfate. Now guys, go slow and think through this with me. Chromium, there are two. Sulfur, there are three. And oxygen, there are 12. We could look up their masses multiply, and then add, and we could come up with the mass of this thing. But guys, we're going to do this a little bit differently. 
This is actually a very important skill, but this skill is a very small piece of a much, much larger puzzle. So rather than doing all of this work in order to figure out the mass, we are going to streamline this process. And guys, let me show you how, and I would encourage you to write this down with me. So what we're going to do in order to streamline this process is we are simply going to look up the masses of these, um, of these atoms. So if we look up the mass of chromium, I have 51.9. Let me make sure, conferring with my other periodic table. Um, I have 51.9, but that actually it rounds up. So guys, the mass of chromium to, to one decimal place rounds up to 52. But then you'll notice that we have two of these. So each chromium weighs 52, but there's two of them. 52 times 2 is 100.4, I'm sorry, 104.0 um, atomic mass units. And all we're going to do, guys, is write that up above. Now we need to find the mass of sulfur. And sulfur's mass is 32.1. So sulfur weighs 32.1, but notice there are three sulfurs. So when we do that math, we have 32.1 times 3, which is 96.3. So those three sulfurs weigh 96.3 atomic mass units. Then we need to do the oxygen. Oxygen has a mass of 16.0, but now notice that there are 12 oxygens. So 16.0 times 12 is 192.0 atomic mass units. Now what we do is we add those three numbers together, and when we add those together, we get 392.3 atomic mass units, and that would be the mass of chromium-3 sulfate. Now, guys, what you're going to see is this. On the answers to the homework, I wrote out the solutions like this, like the one that we did previously. I wrote them out so that you can see all the details. But what I would much rather have you do is the way that we figured out this formula mass by simply doing the math in our head, writing down the masses of the individual elements up above those elements and then adding them together. Again, guys, you're going to be much better served if you learn to do this this way, simply because you need to not only do this well, you need to learn to do it pretty quickly because, again, it's a small piece of a bigger puzzle. So, guys, that's it. That's what you needed to learn today. Again, we reviewed a little bit with significant digits. Now you also have an idea of how to figure out formula masses for salts, but also for molecules. So in a moment, we're going to hand you your homework packet. We are doing homework assignment number one. Um, you'll notice that in the first column, you're writing formulas, just like on the test. And then you're figuring out their formula masses. Guys, notice that I didn't give you enough room to do a lot of work. Um, if you want to do a lot of work, you're welcome to do that on another sheet of paper. But again, guys, my recommendation would be to learn to do these the same way that I just modeled this one so that you can do them quickly and efficiently. Um, so guys, that's what we're up to today. You have the remainder of the class period to get this assignment done. Um, some of you may need the entire period. Some of you may get done quickly. Um, but guys, again, remember um, that when we're done, we're going to find something else productive to work on. Um, you're welcome to work now um, with the person next to you in table groups. Keep the work focused and productive. And guys, I look forward to seeing you um, next time in class. That's all. Have a great day.